Uh, we're here to talk to you about democratizing impact investing, one financial advisor at a time. My name is Christina Leonhovit. I'm one of the managing partners of Tideline, a specialized impact investment consulting and, uh, firm, and I'll be moderating this incredible panel on a really important topic. Um, so just to kick it off, I'm going to give a few brief intros. We don't spend too much time on bios, uh, but... Um, First, I'd like to say we're, we're, we're all here, I think, because we believe in impact investing at some, some deep level in our souls. Um, but it's a market I think we are all aware it's dogged by perceptions of elitism, um, perceptions that it's reserved for, um, you know, a few ultra high net worth individuals or the institutions that have been created to serve them. Um, so in that context, democratizing access to impact investing is truly an urgent priority for, for our market. Um, and I think we, we spend a lot of time talking about access to capital amongst entrepreneurs who need it the most. Here we're talking about access from, from a different ang angle, access to impact investment product from your everyday households, um, individuals across the world and, and the country who really want to see their their capital being invested in responsible, impactful ways. Um, we have an incredible lineup here. Um, first with uh, all the way on the, my left, Jackie Vanderberg, who's Managing Director and Head of Sustainable and Impact Investing at Bank of America's Global Wealth and Investment Management uh, Group. Jamie Martin, who's uh, representing um, the other big uh, platform <laughs> in our country, uh, Morgan Stanley, Executive Director of the Global Sustainable Finance Group, also across the wealth and institutional investment management uh, businesses. Uh, Rahana Natu, uh, who uh, runs Spectrum Impact, a boutique consulting firm, but has many years of experience in this market, both from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, BNY Mellon, uh, and other parts. Um, and Josh Levin, who's the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Open Invest, a venture-based public benefit corporation, uh, bringing wealth management solutions uh, to the market. And Adam Conacher uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation, who's uh, running the innovative finance strategy and zero gap portfolio and um, deeply involved in helping to seed some of the solutions that this market needs. Um, so with that, um, I'd, I'd love to get started. And I'm going to start by just asking each of you to give a, 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 a few brief introductory remarks. What concretely um, are your institutions and you personally doing to help democratize access to impact investing? So Jackie, you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Christina. Um, and um, great to see everybody. If you want to get, I guess, really specific, um, mm -hmm. uh, at Wealth Management for Bank of America, um, you'll know as Merrill Edge, Merrill Lynch, and what was formerly known as U.S. Trust is now known as the private bank at Bank of America. So that's the broad spectrum that we're talking about. And, and if we think about those advisors there, that's about 16,000 and clients who... Um, you know, range from the person who walks into a Bank of America branch office with the first $10,000 that she saved beyond her retirement account is trying to, to, to make an impact with that investment all the way up and through institutions. Um, and so if you specifically, what are we doing? Um, it's about training those advisors um, in different ways and how to talk about this, how to think about it. Um, it's about access to product on the platform and, and specific portfolios. Um, and then putting those pieces together, and we can get into that a little more. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Jamie? Yes, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Jamie Martin from Morgan Stanley. So I sit in the Global Sustainable Finance Group at Morgan Stanley, and we actually sit at the firm level working across our capital markets business, our asset <coughs> management business, and our wealth management business, really building the intelligence center inside Morgan Stanley on all things sustainable and impact investing, and really partner with the various businesses to bring sustainable investing solutions uh, available for our clients, whether they're large institutional clients or 
our, our families or individuals served uh, through our large wealth management business. Um, so yeah, here today, very much here with the wealth management hat on. I, at the end of the day, similar to Jackie, I mean, we are a, an intermediary. We play a matchmaking role, and increasingly, uh, you know, our clients are signaling their interest in sustainable and impact investments across public and private markets. So, a big part of our job is really being the uh, scout team or the radar for innovative strategies that are coming to market that have the capacity to be able to scale through our broad uh, distribution pipes, uh, and, and clearly spending a lot of time on uh, not only the product and solutions, but the education to enable advisors to feel empowered to have these types of conversations. Uh, we've got some new tools to help with that, which I'll get into uh, as well. But yeah, it's been a very interesting perspective. Obviously, this is a space that's moving incredibly fast. Uh, trying to stay on top of it is a, is a full-time job, but we're seeing the demand coming from all sides of our organization now, which is exciting. Great. Awesome, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Rohana. I run a um, strategic advisory company called Spectrum Impact. We focus specifically on building impact investing strategies. So our work in this um, uh, big messy ecosystem is really about getting investors, suppliers of capital, uh, slightly uh, further along the education curve and better partners to many of the folks that are here on the stage. Uh, and so we mostly use strategy. Um, why do impact investing? How does it look? Um, to allow those folks to think about impact investing as a framework that serves its core mission, not the other way around. Uh, and we do that through an education process. Um, and so we have the great pleasure, I think, of watching um, fund managers, corporations, public and private companies move across their education journey in the hopes that they can sort of be better purveyors of capital uh, and use it more effectively. So I'm Joshua Levin. I'm from Open Invest. I was thinking about if this is the conference of patient capital to some degree, we are the impatient ones. <laughs> so we are dedicated to using technology to mainstream uh, values-based investing, and we happily use inpatient capital to do that. Um, we want to see this move fast. We believe that we need technology to achieve a step change in this space. And so what we do, we're about 25 people. We're based in San Francisco. It's a combination of ESG folks like me and hedge fund engineers and technologists. Uh, we build technology to disrupt ETFs and mutual funds. We think that's what stands in the way. And so our software skips funds and manufacturers, buys up underlying securities that would be in your portfolio, and then streams those strategies directly up to advisor workstations and to client interfaces so that people can deeply customize around their values, so they can have impact reporting, so they engage in shareholder resolutions and do all the things that um, the traditional highly intermediated asset management supply chain is standing in the way of. Okay. And Adam Conacher, I'll take the last spot. Um, I want to step back for just a quick second to say, I mean, from the foundation perspective, we don't have the built-in investment clients. We don't have that same perspective. So when we get involved, a lot of the perspective we're taking is sort of um, how to foster and, and grow the, the field of impact investment more broadly. And for us, a big step in that path is um, not just to give you know, individual and retail investors access, but to really inspire them and get them excited about what we're doing in this space, because I think ultimately we want them to challenge the fundamentals of what finance is and can do. Um, and, and they're only going to do that if they can really participate in this movement in the same way that, that some of the larger accredited investors have been able to today. Um, so for us, you know, retail has been a really important um, uh, you know, avenue for us to explore. I would also say it's been by far the most challenging avenue that we've explored, um, but I'll, I'll just give you a quick backdrop on what we've done. Um, we use the grant funding side of the house largely to set up product, to do uh, R&D on new financial products, both for institutional investors and for the retail side. <clears throat> Those products span all asset classes. We look at public and private uh, stuff. We look across all geographies, really trying to say where is it that we think we can get traction um, you know, uh, with, with the various investors that we're trying to approach. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is we, we have an investment fund that we launched in partnership with um, our friends at MacArthur Foundation to really invest in the managers and the products that are coming out of this, this sort of innovation thinking. So to think about what would it take for them to scale, recognizing that if they're ever gonna land on a, a B of A or a Morgan Stanley or, or any of the big you know, distribution platforms, they're gonna have to get to be a lot larger size than they're at today. So the question is, how do we get them to that stage? So we've approached it both from the, you know, the grant side and the investment side, but all with this idea of we've gotta build new products, we've gotta inspire individuals and really try and um, let them in. Great. Great, thank you all. Those are great introductory comments. I'm, I've got some pointed questions for each of you, but I just want to be clear. Let's make this a discussion, so feel free to react to, to one another and jump in. Um, so I, I think one of the big themes, even from this introductory uh, commentary, is what we're, what we're trying to do here is, 
is, quote, mass customization, right? We want clients to have mass, mass access um, to impact investing. We want them to be able to, to, to get solutions that are customized to their press, uh, preferences on a massive scale. Um, to make this successful, we've got, also got to make it easy. We've got to take out the complexity. Jackie, I know B Bank of America is doing a lot already to try and make this accessible and easy for clients with the Merrill Edge platform. And so what are the tensions between trying to make this easy, simple, um, uh, but not so simple that we're, 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 um, we're not achieving the customized needs of, of clients? Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges in yeah. trying to build that out? Um, I think you hit, you, you hit something at least that we, we experience, right? It, it's, it's easy for those of us who've been in the impact space for a while to get really frustrated with the advisors <coughs> as the intermediaries. Like, you know, we, Jamie and I can quote you, <laughs> and you probably can quote back at us our own research saying, you know, um, over 50% of, um, of our clients want this, over 90% of millennials, you know, what's wrong with the advisors, right? But you, you do have to understand that for a lot of them, this is really confusing. They're not sitting in this room. You know, they haven't been on this journey for how long. They are still somewhat, quite frankly, afraid about the returns here. They still have that back of the head. Is this concessionary? Is it... Um, something that we're confining the access, et cetera. Um, and then they, they have the question of, so, you know, what do I do to, to customize, right? If Rahana wants something and Jamie wants something else, and how does that play out? So there's, there's different approaches there. I guess for us, um, part of it has been simplifying it um, so that the conversation with advisors to go through some training, but then in the end to say, this is really for you about a client's preferences um, and their motivations. How are they coming to this? What, what is that motivation? And in, in some sense, what do they want to avoid? Um, either because they think it's risky or because it's their values. And just to be clear, not to overcomplicate this, but that tension is even very real across the board, right? Are, are you coming to this from a financial perspective or from a values perspective? And it's usually both, but that can get all tricky for advisors. But back to the, you know, so we've, we've put this into an ABC framework. Um, what do you want to avoid? How do you want to broadly have benefit? And what in the world do you want to contribute? And then when advisors get their head around something super simple, like an ABC framework, they can start to say, okay, how do I have a conversation that allows me to know a client better and get on the journey? Because the other thing, Christina, that's a challenge, at least that we've found, is advisors feel like this can be binary. It's a, it's a hundred or not, as opposed to it's a journey. They don't have to have all the answers right away. The client doesn't have to move that quickly and so forth. So our process has been one, to simplify into a, a framework. Um, and then two, to make that connection between the client's preferences and the motivations that they have and the products that we have on our platform. And so they can, the advisors can start to say, okay, <coughs> if I have a client who's really motivated just um, by better products, or be I'm sorry, better companies, and they're not really a specific thematic investor, what are a set of products that are compelling for that person versus if I have a client who's really motivated by a specific theme, healthcare or something else, then how do I help them avoid benefit and contribute? Um, with all of that, that, that mapping pro preferences to products, I'll admit, it we're still moving that forward in terms of how we play that together. And that's the piece that I feel like the field, we can talk about that as we go forward. But Well, uh, the ABC, it's brilliant. It's obviously grounded in the, IM, the impact management yeah. project's work. So kudos to them for, for coming up with that. But it's also a brilliant uh, framework for advisors to, to feel like this is simple, right? Yeah. This is not that complicated. Jamie, I, I, I mean, Morgan Stanley's facing the same challenges, right? How, how do you think about how to deliver a customized experience, particularly in a public markets product context? Let's face it, most of, most of the clients of B of A and Morgan Stanley um, need public markets securities and funds in their, in their portfolio. H how do you give that customized experience? That yeah, context? no, absolutely. I mean, our experiences just as our, you know, over 
two and a half million clients have very different set of financial goals. They tend to have a very different set of impact goals as well. And so we need to basically deliver a full spectrum of solutions across the entire sustainable and impact investing uh, opportunity set uh, with the funds that have the track record and the capacity and uh, the kind of operational uh, skill set to interact with a broad distribution platform like ours. So um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we think this is really about putting the, the client in the center of the conversation and, and asking some some pretty basic questions when it comes to what wealth management really gets at at its core. Um, I think, um, you know, ultimately, you know, what's the most popular question that a financial advisor gets from their client? It's, you know, how am I doing or, or how are we doing? And we've always had a very good answer to that on the financial uh, side. We can give you a, a quarterly statement and we our firms spend lots of money on understanding, uh, you know, the portfolio allocations, the risk, the risk profiles of of, uh, of clients. But on the impact side, how can you, at a kind of portfolio level, distill uh, into um, you know an easily kind of comprehensible way, um, you know, what ultimately is the impact and the alignment of the portfolio? And so uh, we spent a lot of time going out to try to find a partner to help us uh, do that. We ultimately decided to build it in house. Uh, many of the broad financial services firms now are, you know, essentially technology companies and we're um, really, um, you know, being able to turn on these types of tools in that intermediary role we think makes a lot of sense. Um, so this tool, it's called Morgan Stanley IQ, uh, or Morgan Stanley Impact Quotient, and it's uh, being turned on for all of our advisors on their desktop in the way that they uh, can turn on different client reporting uh, as they would present to any investment committee or family or um, individual to help them understand how their investments are performing. And it's really designed to, to do three things. It allows us to capture what a client cares about from an impact perspective uh, and really try to prioritize that. Now, some clients want to pick absolutely everything, and so uh, having them really focus on what matters most to them in terms of their vision of a more sustainable-oriented uh, world. Um, and that's when we, once we have that information, since we've got this big distribution network, we can start to basically crowdsource where the product demand is. We can play that back to asset <coughs> managers to help them inform investment product development, uh, which is a a little bit, you know, flying blind uh, up to date now. I think again on the public versus private side, there's um, we're turning this on first in the public market context. The private markets, you know, sometimes people come to us and they want to invest in a early stage solar lantern company in sub-Saharan Africa, and they're super passionate about that, but they don't have the resources or um, you know the the investment dollars to to do that type of investing, or it would be an extremely risky approach, and you got to walk them back to understanding the different approaches in the public market context. So, uh, yeah, we did between the impact solution side, which is the products and revenues that a company is producing, versus um, the sustainable corporate practices, which is more the ESG. And then once we have that information, we can now x-ray a portfolio, essentially benchmark it and make a determination of how aligned or unaligned the portfolio is uh, at the entire uh, portfolio level with what the client cares about most. And before, we always used to joke that, that's great, we'll give you an impact report, but we're going to print you a binder because we've got to go to each manager understand their exact, you know, sustainability report, their engagement report, their CSR report, whatever they might call it, send you back all, you know, 10 or 8 or 10 managers into a big binder and no one really has the time to kind of go through that. So uh, this tool is, is trying to break that down into the portfolio level and being able to aggregate it at the firm level and then, or at the portfolio level, and then ultimately also make suggestions to the advisor for funds that have very similar financial characteristics but superior impact alignment. And that's where the advisor sets them up really nicely for an impactful conversation, which is at the end of the day, they're there, you know, to provide advice to help their clients meet their, their wealth goals. Um, mm -hmm. And so we think this is a key component going forward forward. Very cool. Well, maybe we can return <laughs> to the question of those clients who are really craving an impact solution yeah. product set, but they've got to be walked back <coughs> yeah, to Yeah, ultimately it's about ESG getting them the, the intel and the insights to make it, a much more informed decision about that as well, yeah. I think, before, both for the advisor and for the client. You know, how do you give them the, the information to, to make an informed decision? Uh, yeah. And we think that tool is, you know, it's, a, it's in the journey, as you said, but uh, that's a good first step. Yeah. Rahana, you're working as an independent advisor right mm -hmm. now, but you've also have experience working on a bank platform, mm -hmm. trying to break down the walls of a wealth <laughs> management business without, you know, uh, opening kimono on right. <laughs> uh, internal politics. I wonder if you could share a little bit of your lessons learned from that effort yeah. um, and, and how you're carrying that into your work today. Yeah, no, happy, very happy to. Um, so when I was with Bank of New York Mellon, we were, um, uh, we were trying to do two things at the same time. We 
we were trying to understand how we could create our own fund of funds mechanism that would really reward and celebrate managers in both the venture side and the private debt side that were really investing in companies that fit the corporate mission, particularly around technology and access to financial services. And then we were trying to bring this at scale on the wealth management side. And as Jackie and Jamie have both perfectly articulated, the model in and of itself rewards some behavior over others. And so on the wealth management side, I think what, what I had experienced is in order for impact investing to actually become a, a set of services provided, they need to promote and or sell products on the Bank of New York Mellon platform. And in order for the products to get on the Bank of New York Mellon platform, you need a whole set of stakeholders within Bank of New York Mellon that are finding the right managers or onboarding the right managers or creating bespoke custom product. In order for that to happen, you need enough credit critical mass on the, on the institutional side or on the individual side to make that cost make sense. And so what I think many of us have struggled with, and there are folks that are figuring out how to do it on this very stage, was that the, the, the mechanism of informing that critical mass is very, very complex. There's power embedded in multiple different places. And ultimately, at the end of the day, um, it's very hard to figure out who is going to start the flywheel. Who is actually going to kick off this massive demand? Is it the clients themselves? Is it the advisors? Is it the product structures? Um, <clears throat> and I think, as is the case in many large institutions, it can be a little bit challenging to figure out who pushes the door open so everyone else can follow. Uh, and in large, large institutions, it's even harder because everyone has their own reporting mechanism. They have their own um, benchmarks for the year. They have their own quarterly performance. So sort of learning from that process, Spectrum is particularly focused on educating the suppliers of capital. Um, uh, and so uh, this is something that you all at Tideline deal with all the time, but the education process is, uh, it's not a fee-based process always, right? The education process is a long, cumbersome, exhausting, sometimes not very rewarding process of getting folks to really be able to ask better questions, demand the right things, expect from their financial advisors reasonable, practical things, right? Um, so that you're not facing 10 clients that are all asking for something totally different tomorrow and no one else wants to do that. That educating suppliers of capital is actually as important if in our perspective, not more important to make sure that they are responsible clients and customers in this ecosystem. They're investing in cause community, uh, they're investing in actual companies. Are they being responsible investors? Are they thinking about the impact they can have, the things that they can demand in a thoughtful, cost-effective, reasonable way? And so we really focus on the suppliers of capital in the hopes of changing their education journey so that they can come to basically every organization on this stage and be much more reasonable in how they can feed that ecosystem um, and that really came from, I think, seeing at Bank of New York Mellon just how complex it is for someone to take the first step. And so our theory of change is suppliers of capital can help take that first step, but they sort of need to go back to school uh, in a very sort of euphemistic way and, and, and be able to be better uh, and more responsible stewards of that money. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I mean, there's some tension in our conversation right. already between you know, Jamie saying we're a financial service company, essentially a technology company at this point. So we need to bring these solutions at scale, technology-based solutions to the need for this education, right. this deep hand-holding amongst right. advisors and clients. Josh, you run a technology company <laughs> uh, that's really trying to sort of mainstream access um, through the power of technology. How are, how are you dealing with the need for education, the ongoing need for education, the ongoing need for, for customization in a technology context? Yeah, so l let me tell you a story. So we started our company, Open Invest, in 2015 in Y Combinator. There were three co-founders, so I came, I've been in this space about a dozen years now, and then two other guys from Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund. Um, who, by the way, had never even heard of ESG or SRI, didn't even know. They thought they had to just leave finance to find their souls. And I was like, hey guys, there's this thing here. And it's growing pretty fast, but you know, the product menu is kind of crappy and it's high priced. And, um, but the biggest problem we saw was that everyone has different values. So if we're actually gonna tackle this market, let alone unlock the opportunity, you have to solve for infinite combinations. And I don't know, as you guys talk about these things, if like large firms are not equipped right now to address that. We see it on our platform all the time. People come in, I care about gender diversity and net neutrality, and I love Tesla, I don't want Facebook, um, and I inherited a bunch of GM stock, so I shouldn't have that in my portfolio. Oh, but now I just watched this documentary, I changed my mind again. 
So, <laughs> you know, like even around uh, your family can agree. Try and go home tonight and have a family conversation on what are our, you know, shared values. It's going to be a long conversation. So we founded the company with a mission. So that's what we mean. We're a public benefit corporation. So we have a mission in our legal charter, uh, which is to use technology to mainstream values-based investing. And at the time, my thesis was it's all about personalization. And once we can make this truly personal and engaging, then you know, it's going to take off. I was wrong. Um, it turns out that personalization is very valuable, but it certainly does not unlock the dams of demand for what we're all doing here. But I now have full conviction as to what it is that will. Um, which is that ESG is going to mainstream as features, not as product. And, and let me explain that. So in wealth management, you have something like 90% retention rates. Clients do not change products or providers. And this shapes the entire industry. If you're frustrated about the rate of innovation, it's because if Morgan Stanley spends millions of dollars on something, they face all the compliance risk, operational burden, and how many Goldman clients are they going to steal at the end of the day? Right. So it's, you know, fundamentally you have, it, it stops before the client and it's a slow industry as a result um, because the client's never going to switch. So what you need to do is be able to go out to advisors and clients and say, hey, I'm not going to ask you to switch funds. So this whole space that we're in has been built up around like a fund-based business model. Switch from this Vanguard fund to this Calvert fund. So the whole, everything inches along. Instead, you should go out to clients and say, hey, here's this button. And if I press this button, whatever you care about most, you know, or things you care about, so Amazonian deforestation or whatever the, it is, the risk of that is going to be virtually eliminated from your portfolio. And it is not going to affect your performance or your cost structure. Do you want to hit the button? That's when everybody wants to do it. And so I think you need to use technology to fully abstract the values conversation away from the financial complexity and implications so that you don't need the advisors to get all educated on these new managers and tell these whole new stories and also have to explain why they didn't have them in this before. Instead, they can say, OK, you know, let's talk about sports, let's talk about college, let's talk about what you care about, boom. Right? And that needs to get seamlessly overlaid on the portfolio. It's also impact reporting, which, you know, it's amazing what you guys have done. We do this as well. So, you know, here's your performance this month, this quarter, and here's how many tons of carbon you save this month, this quarter, and it's equivalent to playing this many trees. Here's how many cigarettes you, you know, avoid financing. It's proxy voting. It's a whole ecosystem of features that become available, uh, and many others will build, that will be reliant on a clean, data reactive supply chain that actually supplies these things and you know that's a whole nother conversation um, actually implementing what i'm talking about is very disruptive but at the end of the day i believe that features is how we get esg into the hands it's how we get the 90 percent uptake the holy grail that we're all looking for can you guys react to that i mean i i think this is a <laughs> sort of revolutionary thought i mean but josh was talking about ultimately to what i'm hearing is disintermediating the advisor <laughs> from the, the supply chain, disintermediating the managers from the supply chain, right? Making this completely a flexible open architecture that clients can manipulate for their own I, Sorry, I just Is want to correct that real quick because I don't want to okay. have a robo-advisor conversation. I actually think the advisor is the star of the show. What's happening and what people missed a few years ago was like, oh, our robots going to take over advisors? Dead wrong. Robots are going to take over manufacturers. The people that are in trouble are folks like Vanguard, BlackRock. Like, I mean, the scale they've created doesn't even matter anymore because they've just they're dropping their fees to zero. And even with the move to indexing, like you're basically saying this whole thing can be automated. So when, when technology hits a vertical, at the end of the day, all that matters is the raw, intersubjective human interactions. That's where the margins are. Everything upstream of that is going to ones and zeros. And that's why Goldman bought United Capital. That's why we have Aladdin Wealth. Everyone's racing downstream because we can basically move light manufacturing into the fingertips of advisors now. And their client relationship is the only remaining strategic asset in this value chain. So now I'll shut up. React, but it's, I think we agree on the role of advisors. 
Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, advisors are hungry to have the tools at their fingertips to have these types of conversations with their clients. We have uh, solutions that are on our type platforms that are a, kind of version 1.0 of what Josh has described. They've, just, they've raised quite a bit of assets in the public market context because they are able to have this kind of menu approach and you can tilt the portfolio with minimum track record or tracking error. Um, and then the other dynamic for uh, high net worth individuals around this idea of tax loss harvesting, which can be a component as well uh, in terms of kind of a carrot to get people engaged in, in the discussion. And especially in the next gen conversation, there's a lot of talk obviously on the next generation of wealth transfer. Advisors are using impact and sustainable investing as a hook to engage that next gen. They've got the relationship with the patriarch and matriarch that, but there's some shocking statistics on how unlikely that next-gen client is actually going to necessarily stay with the advisor uh, that their parents or grandparents had. Um, and so I think these types of tools are, are facilitating that. I think obviously, you know, they're, um, you know, they're going to be uh, disrupting incumbents and they're going to be scaling and, and getting their technology out there. Our firms are very, you know, risk adverse to, uh, you know, startup type asset managers, but they're out there proving that their technology is working. And at the end of the day, if that's what clients are uh, reacting to and, and if they can see their views, uh, their impact and their, their values expressed in that type of solution start to translate to, to positive outcomes, it's a very, very powerful concept. I probably, I mean, we're going to have violent agreement here on the role of advisors. So, you know, in terms of that conversation, although we do on our Merrill Edge side um, have, you know, the, the equivalent of the robo where folks are making those choices. And it's interesting right now, they, they do have a couple of different questions and you can choose an impact portfolio or a traditional portfolio. And um, we're seeing somewhere between 20 and 25% choosing impact portfolios. And that's with zero um, additional marketing or push or anything like that. So that's a, you know, just a bellwether of sort of what's to come. Um, I think, agree that the, the features or, or customization does matter. It's interesting, I, I will say advisors find oftentimes um, you can get a little bit of a, a blank slit, a stare or almost overwhelmed from people if you ask them, you know, what they care about. So that conversation is important to um, have the advisor be able to, to go through that because it can sort of, um, almost become a little bit of whiplash. Like, mm -hmm. well, do I care about the Amazon and ocean plastics and gender? And all of a sudden you made it harder for me um, than when I came in here. You gave mm -hmm. me almost more of a burden. So there is some, at least for us, simplification. We're finding big themes that people, that re really resonate with, um, as opposed to absolutely everything has to be impacted through your public market portfolio. Um, and then I guess we'll go to this a little bit more, Christina, maybe later in the conversation back to pick up what Jamie was saying, but this aspect of active passive, um, there is a, a conversation about the next generation of active managers and how they're picking up um, sustainability business models that's not currently in the ESG metrics. So that's a Mm -hmm. Another conversation. Yeah, that is. Let's go back to that question. I think that's an important one. Adam, I want to bring you into this conversation. Rockefeller Foundation is an interesting player in this market. Well, I mean, with all respect, why is Rockefeller Foundation even engaged <laughs> in this conversation? I mean, why, why isn't this retail product gap being solved by the private markets institutions that are uh, represented on this panel, what what role Rock, is Rockefeller particularly looking to play to help solve this gap? Yeah, well, I think um, I mean to be clear as well, we're also not solving it because it's a very complicated, <laughs> uh, a very complicated gap, and I think we're certainly working towards it and trying to support a lot of partners that we think can can have significant contributions. But there's a number of reasons. Um, why even in our portfolio, you'll see a lot of struggles. Um, you know, very early on. I, go back to your point, Josh, around sort of. Um, you know, is it product or is it this sort of additionality, this engagement, something else that gets tacked onto the product? I mean, our core strategy for the last several years has been um, let's find products that we think can, if you will, leverage um, track record where we think it exists, you know, big market opportunities like CDFIs or the investments DFIs are making in emerging markets, those kind of things where we think there's actually a, a big opportunity. And let's try and push those things towards retail where we think there's a, a natural connection. Um, and it's a lot harder than, you know, than that to do it, basically. Those products aren't landing and they're not inspiring. And we've done some really creative things, actually. I think, um, you know, we've got one product that we supported, which is, is really cool, called Impact Shares. Um, they've launched three ETFs, public market strategies, 
Um, and what they're trying to do is basically say, you know, we're going to partner with, in this case, it's the NAACP, it's the YWCA, and it's UNCDF um, to launch a gender empowerment, a minority empowerment, and then sort of a, a low income, uh, least income uh, economy sort of strategy. And in all cases, you know, those, those are great strategies. They're designed by those partners and they get 100% of the net management fee because Impact It Shares itself is a nonprofit. And so um, our thinking on this was, you know, when, you're, when your FA goes to have this conversation, it's trying to explain a very complicated ESG metric, you know, MSCI, whatever it might be, uh, strategy, maybe it would be easier if we just said, this is the NAACP who you already have a relationship with. They're validating it, and by the way, they're getting paid for their active engagement of this portfolio over time. Um, and I, it's not that I don't think that strategy can work, because I actually do think it's gaining traction and it is working in some cases, but it's not scaling to hundreds of millions of dollars because it's just not that simple, right? The product is not going to be the one thing that, that's missing. And I think that's been a big part of our learning over the last couple of years is, is maybe there are opportunities inside and outside the product space. And, and uh, you know, Josh, we've talked before about, for example, you know, what should we do with shareholder voting, right? Like proxy voting, is, is this an opportunity? Is that a, a place to inspire people without asking them to change entirely their portfolio? And so I think, um, you know, we've looked at a lot of these sort of themes um, in, in that sense. Um, but one thing I just want to revisit back to your question about sort of why Rockefeller um, yeah. and, and why do we continue to engage beyond the fact that, again, we think this is a critical step for the impact investing space to take, right, is, is to really begin to get actual traction at the individual level and drive it down so that we're including a lot more people in the conversation of what this is and what finance can be. Um, but it's also that we have very interesting capital, right? We don't have the same boundaries that basically everyone else in this stage is going to run into. Mm -hmm. We've got grant capital. We can do innovation. We can really test um, different areas. We can partner with totally different uh, groups. You know, we can partner with all the independent advisors, or we can try and, and build something that heads towards, you know, the, the sort of the big shops like Morgan Stanley and, and, and B of A. So I think, you know, there is a role for innovation. There is a role for testing. There is a role for sort of incubating new technologies, new thinking that can support a lot of the work that happens here. And that's really where we see ourselves is, is really incubating that. Um, the other one last thing I'll say on that front is, um, you know, there's also a historical role for, for supporting the industries as they grow into these, these paths. And so mm -hmm. as we think about, you know, the catalytic capital that we can deploy and, and the fund that we've got to, to support products and managers, um, it really is saying, you know, how many investments is it going to take to get you onto one of these platforms? It's saying, mm -hmm. what is that handoff going to look like and how do we be very strategic about not just supporting you on fund one, but really growing the manager capacity and, and building it and recognizing that in some cases that's a five, ten or longer year investment. And um, it's not that foundations are really great at staying in one lane for 10 years because I <laughs> fully recognize they're not, but they do to some degree have that scope and can, and can lock in some of those, that thinking. So I think... Um, you know, we want to incubate and grow these these big areas and opportunities that we hope do land in this space. We want to think about the ad additional sort of, you know, tack on engagement strategies that I think are really critical. And, and you know, product for us will still be a very important piece, but recognizing all the limitations why product is not going to be enough. Fantastic. Well, it's, it's amazing to me to hear us kind of home in on this common theme, which is even in, on the, you know, the spe end of the spectrum where you're innovating and incubating new products, it all boils down to the access piece, right? How do we, how do, what are the access points? The advisors, obviously, seems we have consensus on this panel. The advisor's not going away um, and they're the front lines. I'd like to open it up to the audience and get some questions from, from you all and um, kind of take this conversation in the direction you'd like to see it go before we uh, go further down our own rabbit hole. So um, I know we have a couple of mics uh, wandering around. So if you could kind of stand up or raise your hand. Um, and I know they'll get a mic to you soon. Who's going to be the first brave participant? Here we go. <laughs> hey there, thank you for being here today. Uh, real quick, so much of this seems to be focused around public equities and the public equity markets, creating whether it's something similar as an open platform to get to equities or other platforms that you all have at B of A and Morgan Stanley. When you look at the moniker of impact, what else are you bringing to your clients, primarily the Morgan Stanleys and Bank of Americas, um, that are one-off private deals, things like that? How do you get that onto your platform with the scale that you have with the number of advisors? So you mentioned specifically like solar lanterns in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, is that really a deal that you could bring to your clients or is that something that's down the line? Um, penetrating that particular space as, a, as we look at impact versus public equity markets? That's a great question. Do you want to just share your name and organization? Yeah, Ed Dowdy, 
uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Great. Who wants to? So take it's that a one it's a great question. It's a one that we um, collectively have had a lot of conversations about, and and it's probably no news to the folks in this room that it is a challenge um, to get uh, private market um, products into a, a wealth management um, channel. So the I mean the short answer is the one-off deals are, is not something that we will do, right? We're not going to, um, that's something that we find you end up doing with more of a bespoke manager who's gonna create a, a, a private market option for a, a ultra high net worth individual. Um, we are increasingly seeing um, private funds, hedge funds, private equity funds, et cetera, that are at the scale that they are um, eligible for the platform. And so that's something that we're excited about, but um, still trying to crack the nut on that. And then the, the other side is we are increasingly seeing impact in public market funds. Um, although we're, we're really trying, I think the whole industry is trying to decide how do you frame that? And the impact management project previously mentioned, I think has a, a good model of how to think about contribute if you think about the IFC um, framework that they came out in terms of um, not just metrics but management of funds how can we really say in public markets are you having impact either by advocacy or by um, some level of product and, and solution focus so those are the two sides that we're looking yep. at yeah, I mean, we would categorize on our platform impact investing as predominantly in the private markets. We're investing directly in, in funds or investing in companies that are addressing social and environmental challenges. Same uh, situation that Jackie described. I also think, I mean, we also, you know, categorize funds as ESG integration. I also feel like, you know, if you're a really good ESG integrated public market fund, that's fine. You don't need to go, like, you know, rebrand yourself as an impact fund. I think you're seeing, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, we're living through, like, a live business school case study and all this stuff. You're seeing these big, huge GP um, funds that have certainly woken up to the fact of impact investing as a way to gather assets. I think, you know, at the end of the day, the clients inside our firms that are focused focused on impact, um, you know, they're seeing through a little bit of that sheen that those managers bring. I think there's also the argument to be made that that is a step in the right direction. These funds and GPs wouldn't be launching these types of funds if they didn't think um, that they wanted to put their name and their resources behind it. I think the market's going to start to clear some of that, uh, but there's a gap, right? You've got very catalytic funds that are doing extraordinary work around impact with deep, measurable impact, producing financial returns, um, but they're simply not set up to deal with an organization like ours. And ultimately, again, it's this you know, euphemistic term around distribution. Um, you know, Josh's technology is, you know, there, you could see how that could be distributed and scaled quickly. Um, it's a software, you know, type technology at the end of the day. The funds that um, are on the impact on the private market side, there's just capacity. Like, is it really appropriate to put them on a platform like ours because they'd be, you know, inundated, you know, it's, it's <laughs> Many people aren't going to have a problem with having too much money, but if you're not being able to match up how you're deploying into your strategy with the fund that's, that's coming in, it can be a real problem. Um, and I think, again, as Jackie mentioned too, it's how do you categorize the funds into the themes that people are, are gravitating for. So we're seeing a lot around climate solutions, obviously, gender diversity, which Jackie's a leader on as well. And so I think that has helped orient some of that. There's also every deck you see these days has the SDGs slapped on it. And so <laughs> I think... Um, calibrating that side. The only other thing I'd mention that I think there's a big um, interest in and there's just a dearth of product is this idea of place-based investing. People love this. If you can see the projects, the companies in your backyard, you know, we have 700 wealth management offices around the country and obviously very uh, geographically diverse here in the U.S. Um, and so we've been, um, Morgan Stanley has underwritten some large bonds for CDFIs. We actually just turn on the uh, uh, impact note from Capital Impact Partners. Calvert's had a product uh, for many, many years and been very successful on this, but they've been struggling to kind of being turned on on a platform like ours. So we're hoping we can start to build the market around some of these more impactful organizations when they're, uh, it might, you know, again, you can argue with whether or not it's a public or private market vehicle, uh, but clearly the impact is, is there and on the ground and measurable uh, and they're delivering on the returns as well. Great. Great. Can, I, can I just add yeah. something really yeah, quick? Please. I just I thought it was a really really thoughtful question, and I think one of the things that we have actually found in in 
our focus on the on the investor education side is actually really digging in on some of the ideas or misconceptions around public or private. So I think a lot of the storytelling around direct investment is really, really compelling. And that's right. That's what's gotten us here. That's what's motivating people. We, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that somewhere between 90 to 92% of our clients walk in on day one and boldly and proudly pro proclaim, we're going to start a fund. And then we sort of have a conversation on, are you, are you willing to take a seven-year lockup? Are you willing to be risky with your capital? When do you need to show your stakeholders that it's working? And very, very quickly, we realize that, no, we're actually not in a position to start a fund. That what we should be talking about is really thoughtful, subordinated debt or partnership in a Rockefeller product that's really thinking about catalytic capital or potentially using modern portfolio theory that's already out there to just think about better exposure on the public side. And so I think, I think one of the responsibilities uh, all of us in the space have, but particularly intermediaries like ours, is to be really, really clear that impact is possible in absolutely every asset class. Whatever its definitional allegory is, whether it's ESG or SRI or impact, it's possible in every asset class. And so starting with what is the change that you want to see whether it's with the SDGs or whether it's uh, in a place, in a community, what is the change that you want to see seems to be a better starting point to then have a conversation around, okay, where do we put that money that makes sense for you? Um, and I, I think it's a, it, it can be a less attractive story, which we found sometimes is that people are saying, well, how do I talk about the Solar Lantern Company? That'll come. But I think we're finding that by starting with an outcomes-based approach, which everybody on the stage is doing, we're getting a lot more clear about how an investment methodology serves that, not not the other way around. So I just wanted to yeah, that's, that. That was really helpful, Rohana. I think there's, a, a again, another theme cropping up here, the, the clarity around segmentation yeah. of products, um, the definitions around the various approaches to impact across products, and then just basic transparency around what these platforms can and cannot offer in those segments is super helpful. Another question in the back? Hi, I'm David O'Leary from uh, World Vision Canada. I head up the impact investing arm of, of World Vision Canada. It's a large INGO. I'd be curious for your perspective. We're thinking a lot about, um, you know, as an INGO that has, you know, across the globe, you know, millions of donors, and in particular the sort of child sponsorship model where you've got people contributing every single month uh, money and clearly care about, you know, our cause and, and mission aligned with you, how you sort of tap into that to create, you know, retail, potentially create retail investment product mm -hmm. to put in front of those people who already buy into and, and are aligned with your mission and find a way to make it real easy for them to say, yeah, you know, I'd like to take some money and, and make an investment that is also, you know, going to um, impact your mission, which I'm already, you know, bought into. And so I'm curious for your perspective, and Adam, you had mentioned specifically kind of how do you tap into those retail investors, you know, you already have the buy-in. So the role of INGOs and, and that sort of relationship they have with, with donors and sort of converting them to investors, um, I'm just mm -hmm. curious for any feedback you'd have on that. I wish we had Kiva on the, <laughs> the panel to take that question, but any, any takers here on that? How do you convert a retail donation-based model to a Investment base. I mean, I'll just say our, our experience with the products we've launched is that it's not so much of a convert as we thought it was. It was more of a let's find the um, where the affinity group also has pots of money. So it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, if, in, um, this isn't something we've, we've finalized or, or been able to be successful on, but the, the strategy has been more on, you know, it's not let's take the NAACP donors and convert the donation. We actually want the donation to continue, but let's see if there's a way we can convert some of their portfolio or let's go to the historically black colleges and universities who may also align with this strategy directly and already have a relationship to the NAACP or, or however it may land. Um, and, and, you know, it's the same thing from the UNCDF perspective and, and they're looking at sort of, you know, we've got these donor countries who have been contributing for years who might be able to have a big, uh, bigger catalytic effect if they also put in some of the, the money that they may have sitting in other pots. So, for us, it hasn't. We've not been so successful on the conversion piece. If that's, if I'm understanding the question correct on that side, um, but it's not to say that there's not completely other pots of money that we haven't had the conversation around, right? And and that has actually been fairly interesting. And, and you'll see the same thing. I mean, um, with some of the funds we've launched on that side, we're getting interest and in, in conversations with, you know, union groups and 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 the pensions that sit behind some of these uh, big organizations that work on these issues that really want to explore if there's a, a role for them to play in that as well. So. Um, I do think there is an affinity group, albeit it's not so much the conversion. Um, and then for us, you know, as you think about sort of positioning it, because this was a big part of our, our strategy here, was really 
what role is you know, the NAACP or any nonprofit able to actually play in having this conversation? I will say that there's also a lot of, um, there's a lot of bumps in that road too, right? In terms of how they can't sell that product, right? They're not, they don't wanna go down SEC registration. They've gotta be very, very careful as to what their formal engagement is on the product. So I think um, you know, the structuring and, and the legal design of, of setting up something like that and taking on that role is there. Um, that being said, their brand is super important and that has been what we lead with because that goes back to, you know, Rahana was talking about storytelling and this kind of stuff. And, and one group that's good at storytelling is actually the nonprofits that are actually doing the work daily. Um, and so we have been very, very successful at leveraging that piece of it and, and um, you know, really putting them front and center of the conversation. And I think, you know, that's kind of the, what are, you know, what is everyone good at? And, and then the, the product should be structured to leverage that piece of it and not, you know, not so much try to put people in a, in a new position. Hey, I saw another question back here. Yeah. Hi, uh, Fernando <coughs> Concha from 17 Asset Management. Uh, so, uh, Regina, you just said like impact can be done in any asset class. And my question is, in the public markets, unless you have a proxy vote, how do you generate impact? <laughs> yeah, I mean, is there I, real measurable <laughs> impact in the judge. public market? I, I, I want to make a comment more broadly on this, and it might be heresy in, in the community <laughs> at SOCAP. So, first of all, if we're talking about democratization, 90, like, and we're talking about addressing normal folks, the vast majority of their capital is in public markets, equities and fixed income. So, either we can make cocktail party stories or we can actually democratize. That's one thing. The second is that these corporations are more powerful than governments. Mm -hmm. They're only getting more powerful. Amazon's gonna take over everything. Sorry to tell you. And um, there's good news though, which is that we actually all own these companies where they've socialized themselves essentially in order to compete in the market. It's like we are fueling the system, right? If Exxon wants to go spread uh, climate change denial pseudoscience, they're doing it because they've calculated it's the best way to generate returns for you, right? You're demanding it through your intermediaries. So they did it for you. Um, and yes, it does come back in some ways to shareholder resolutions. So there's no reason that all the shareholders of Apple can't be having a conversation right now about what their company should be doing. It's our company. The CEO works for you. They report to you. Um, but I also think on the impact side, it is about translating that. So these impact metrics are very powerful. The numbers are huge. I mean, the calculations we do are straightforward. Like this is the carbon footprint of this company. You own 0.0001% of its market cap. So you own 0.001% of their carbon footprint. And if you divest, you don't. Now it doesn't mean you've taken that carbon out of the market, um, but you have avoided financing that carbon. And I think in some ways this is, becomes a categorical, categorical imperative. So at scale, yes, their cost of capital, their price is based on supply and demand. Um, no one questions voting, uh, even though your vote is negligible. And frankly, I think unless you live in a swing state at the federal level, what you do with your capital, and most of that is in public markets, is probably the most powerful tool that you have to change the world in your everyday life. So just to build on that, I mean, I, I, it is a question um, that gets asked a lot, and um, my own journey was really more in the private markets um, earlier, and then coming over to the, the bank about six years ago, I will say personally, I was not as aware of how impactful public markets were in um, decisions in large corporations until working at the bank where we would get a phone call from the C-suite every time there was a new indice launched, you know, that are we in or out? And if we're not in, what would it take for us to be in and who of our peers is in? And so in a way that I had not personally experienced um, some of what the growth in ESG products has created is a race to the top in corporations. And you can argue that that race to the top, um, you know, whether we all give paternity leave or not, um, maybe doesn't matter in the same way as some, you know, private market. But it actually, I mean, these are large corporations who are the employers who, you know, there's so many pieces that come from those decisions. So hundreds of thousands of people affected by that little policy change, right? More than all the little 
social impact back to social enterprises in history combined, right? Yeah. They change so, so I think that the, the aspect of what's happening in public markets um, creates that one drive for transparency, right? All, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of pay equity, in terms of policies, in terms of lobbying dollars, all of that stuff is public market money moving and, and influencing. And our lead US equity analyst will say we're at the, the end of the beginning of this space. So we're sort of, what do you want to call it, you know, uh, inning three or something. But the projection is that money flowing into ESG funds is equal to the value of the S&P right now, right? So this, believe it or don't believe it, it doesn't really matter, the money's moving that way. Corporations are really clear. They want to be on the front end of this and they want to be on the front end of this also to attract employees. So there's so many sort of pieces of that flywheel that we can tap in bigger and, and stronger ways. Now, I will also say we're in a big and, so you can do all of that and we have to think about the capital deployment side of this. How do we move money to corporations who are actually um, specifically solving problems? But that's the bigger conversation that corporations are having with the business roundtable and other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Just... We haven't had a chance to get into the whole field of impact reporting and the metrics. You talk about powerful impact metrics. Um, around public companies and if advisors are the first favorite punching bag, ESG data providers are the second favorite <laughs> punching bag in this market. So I, but we only have a minute um, and change left. So I'm gonna ask each of you in six words or less, you know, what would you wish for this market? You know, what specific advancement is needed, um, whether it's reporting, advisor education, better client, uh, awareness, better segmentation. What 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 do we need to to move the needle on democratization? Adam, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need about a thousand things to move the needle effectively. But um, so I'll, I'll point to one. I really like the idea of this sort of um, you know the active engagement in the corporation. I think better defining what active engagement on ESG means and better supporting of active engagement, I think, is a huge step forward. Great, Josh. In patience, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Right. We've got power outages here today because of wildfires. I've, my kids are entering an apocalypse. So we don't have time to create utopia. The stuff I work on is not like the sexiest. It's not the stuff that you know is my dreamland. We have to hit scale. We have to do it today. So the only option is uh, technology, at least in concert with all the other research, white papers, education, media. We need major step changes right now. Rahana. Yeah, I would say each investor, whether you're an institution or an individual, has the responsibility to know themselves first. Yeah, ultimately this is about transparency. Investing historically has not been a transparent industry. These tools are giving our end investors much greater transparency to make an informed decision, and that's very powerful. All the capital markets are interconnected, and there is enormous power in helping people make an informed and intentional choice once they know what they own mm -hmm. to drive that forward. Jackie, last word. You only get six, six words. I think <laughs> simple changes at scale. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that aspect of, you know, there are so many, to Adam's point, there's a thousand things, mm -hmm. but we actually have to do a few of them well and large. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. This is a really complicated um, process. Thanks mm -hmm. for all you're doing to bring access Thank to you. the map. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.